Secure America, I'm Star Parker. And in 1867, American writer Mark Twain visited the Holy Land. He recorded his impressions in a book titled The Innocence Abroad. Twain was appalled when seeing the abandoned and desolate land that was the home of the Bible. He said in the book, the further we went, the hotter the sun got and the more rocky and bare, repulsive and dreary the landscape became. He went on to say, there was hardly a tree or shrub anywhere, even the olive and the cactus, those fast friends of a worthless soil had almost deserted the country." End quote. Some 15 years later, Jews began a movement to return and restore their ancient homeland. By November 1947, the United Nations gave the green light to establish a Jewish state and an adjacent Arab state. Jews accepted the UN partitions of the region, declaring a new state of Israel in May of 1948. But the Arabs, they rejected the plan and attacked the newly declared, newly declared Jewish state. Israel fought and miraculously they prevailed in its war of independence and rebuilding the ancient homeland moved forward. Compared with the desolation described by Mark Twain, Israel today is a modern miracle with per capita gross domestic product higher than that of Great Britain, France, Italy, and Spain, according to the World Bank. As of 2019, Israel had a per capita GDP of around $43,500, much higher than that of its immediate adjacent neighbors. Jordan was approximately $4,400, $4, Egypt about $3,000, Syria about $2,000, Lebanon $7,000. Uh, Israel must be doing something right. It also had the highest per capita venture capital investment in the world. During its short history, from its founding in 1948, with a population of about 800,000 to today, a population over 9 million, Israel has produced 12 Nobel Prize winners. All this while fighting three major wars and dealing with endless attacks from terrorists whose stated goal is to destroy Israel. You know, America's left and left-wing media says that Israelis oppose Palestinians under horrible conditions, and those Palestinians have no choice but to periodically explode with violence like we're seeing now, with missiles being hurled into Gaza, I mean, from Gaza into Israeli civilian population centers. Palestinians in Gaza do live under horrendous conditions, but not because Israelis force them to. They choose to. Israel unilaterally pulled out of Gaza in 2005 and left it under complete Palestinian control. The Palestinians could have started building, putting in place infrastructure for political and economic freedom that would allow them to produce the kind of miracle the Israelis have produced. But instead, they put Hamas in charge, Hamas terrorists, and those terrorists started shooting missiles into Israel immediately at that time. And now we're seeing it again today. So I think we should discuss what is happening in the state of Israel. What has caused this recent violence after four years of not seeing this? How is it similar also to what we're seeing today in America under the Black Lives Matters movement? So I'm going to speak with a really dear friend about this, Matthew Brodsky. He has more than two decades of experience focusing on U.S. foreign policy, national security, He's briefed members of Congress, Department of State, Department of Defense, National Security Council on Iran, on Syria, on Palestinian uh, Israeli issues. He also worked with the Trump administration, who was a major advisor on the Abraham Accords, which is an amazing diplomatic effort to assure peace, to achieve peace in that Middle East between Israel and some of its neighbors. And we were seeing successes there. We were seeing such successes there that this turnaround under a new administration has caught us all a little bit off guard. So I'm going to talk about this with my panel of experts as well. And I'm also going to ask them, is there a relationship between the tactics that are being used by the left in the U.S. on race policy that we're also seeing uh, being used to oppose Israel? So now let's get into this. Let's cut through the noise of the news on this big issue and find some truth today on Cure America. And we're going to do that right after this message. Let's take a quick history lesson. Just two centuries ago, 94% of the people in the world lived in extreme poverty. Today, it's eight and a half percent. 
In a century, our life expectancies more than doubled. How did we come so far so fast? The freedom to create, to start a business, to keep what you earn. Don't let the socialists and radical left cost us our progress, our freedom, and our well-being. It's time we fight for America and vote for America. Hey, it's me, Star Parker, introducing you to something brand new called Power, Poverty, and Politics. And I'm going to usually have someone in the chair next to me. Uh, what we're going to do is start looking in depth on major, major challenges in our country, but mostly through authors, people that are writing tremendous works uh, so that we can engage we can educate ourselves, we can equip ourselves to do amazing things for our country, for our culture, and ultimately for the communities that are so in disarray that they just get so limited information because they've been so controlled by the hardcore left that they don't know what to do. So I'm excited about it, and we're gonna start it within the next couple of weeks, and I just wanted to give you the heads up so that you can start telling your friends, so that you can begin to face it out and to uh, Twitter it out and to do all those other social media out that we're going to start looking at power, poverty, politics from a brand new perspective with me, Star Parker. It's time for a cure. Cure is a coalition of new voices with new ideas that will become new policies. We are the cure. The Center for Urban Renewal and Education, headquartered in Washington, D.C., CURE works with churches, political, and business leaders on behalf of urban communities. CURE's mission is to address issues of culture, race, and poverty from a Judeo-Christian perspective. CURE, join with us, and there has never been a better time to help black communities. in my opening, Matthew Brodsky has more than two decades of experience in these issues we're going to talk about. U.S. foreign policy, Israeli policy, national security, and I just found out that he's writing a new book, so that means you'll see him again. Uh, Matthew, thank you. He's a senior fellow at Gold Institute for International Strategies. You worked firsthand on the development of the Abraham Accords, which a lot of people are not familiar with, that the Trump administration actually brought about an initiative, a peace initiative, and we actually started seeing some amazing things happen there in the Middle East. We're not there today. So why don't you tell us what that was, and then let's bring us to why now are they on the front page with missiles? Well, okay, first as to the Abraham Accords, uh, this was a new way of thinking. The old way of thinking, which had produced zero results was that the Palestinian issue with the Israelis uh, is going to be the ultimate veto over the foreign relations uh, and sovereignty of Israel, of its relations with the entire Arab world. It was also the way the United States conceived of everything, which is that the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is the center of the universe in the Middle East. Okay. This and only a two-state solution would solve it, is right. what we kept hearing. Okay. Right. So they, a successive administrations pushed the same boulder up the same hill to have it fall back on them and kept trying the same thing over and over again. This administration realized that there was a new opportunity in the region for a whole host of reasons, which was that a lot of the states in the Arab world wanted to move past the conflict. Really? If the okay. Fatah, uh, Palestinian Authority corrupt government, the quote, moderate government, is unable or unwilling to move forward as they were, then they should not have a veto over Israel and the United Arab Emirates or <clears throat> Bahrain and other countries' foreign policies. Mm -hmm. So this was to remove that from... Okay, let me see if I'm understanding, because if, if I don't get it, then our audience might not as well on such a complex issue. So what you're saying is that these other players in that region were saying, hey, guys, what about us? Hey, guys, we're trying to get into, and a lot of our very prosperous nations, no doubt, but we're trying to get into the 21st century. Can we expand the discussion? Let me ask you this. Was some of that momentum, because you said you kind of had a feeling that this was in their uh, psyche, uh, was that one of the reasons that the Trump administration decided to move the embassy first, and then months later we saw these Abraham Accords? Well, moving the embassy was part of the peace strategy, which was essentially to say, uh, by continuing to humor 
full maximalist Palestinian demands mm -hmm. and just thinking that at some point they'll climb down off of what no Israeli government would ever accept, mm -hmm. namely the understanding that the capital of Israel is Jerusalem, right. uh, that this would essentially remove that from the situation and force the Palestinian Authority to deal with uh, reality. I mean, the fact is, if everyone continues to indulge the fantasies that they have, uh, then there's never going to be a solution. Part of that gave rise to what the Abraham Accords could be, uh, developing relations, yes. but the embassy move to Jerusalem, look, Everyone has known that the capital of Israel is Jerusalem. Right. To make peace, Egypt's president in the 70s flew to Israel, to Jerusalem, to speak in the Knesset in, it, in, in Jerusalem. Right. That's where you go. And others had promised that that was going to happen. The Trump administration made it happen. We actually saw uh, Iran have to back up a little bit. The Palestinians got a little quiet, and then we started seeing this Abraham Accord. Bring us to that moment, because, you know, I was fascinated and actually had an opportunity to be in Israel when we moved our embassy. And then I went to the White House when the Abraham Accords were signed. But I don't know that a lot of people were watching to say what really happened. What happened that these nations now flew to the country, the leaders of these nations flew to our country to say, we're signing off on a new deal, a new order. Because all we're seeing now is, uh-oh, it's exploding again. It's, and the Biden administration is even trying to blame President Trump and blame the Abraham Accords. So walk us through this very, very gently so that people can understand that this is a good thing, because I think it is. This is a huge thing. Um, first of all, what it does is integrate Israel with the Arab world through economics, through culture, uh, and through a common uh, threat perception, uh, specifically talking about Iran. That's what it does. Now, how it came to be is understanding that there was this common threat from Iran, there are Arab states, Gulf states, <laughs> that are uh, basically run with a, a, an oil-based economy. They realize the future isn't really going to be in hydrocarbons right. for the next hundreds of right. years. Right. They look around and see that Israel is a fantastic, innovative hub. Incredibly so. That they're great to partner with. They're both, I mean, the UAE and Israel are, are leaders in, in medical, in uh, in in a lot of areas in business. So it made sense that, that these countries didn't want to s allow the Fatah movement uh, in the Palestinian Authority, which is different from Hamas, mm -hmm. to have a veto power over this, uh, over their relations. Over what they wanted to do. Right. It's like, hey, we, we have countries too. Right. We're stuck. We're stuck 100 years in this philosophy that, that Israel doesn't have a right to exist. So it's interesting because I was looking at the numbers in my column uh, on this particular issue last week. And I mean, Israel is such a miracle. It was able to grow. And now we're seeing the uh, GDP like amazingly higher than some of these other countries. So you mentioned the economic interests of these other countries. How much was that at the table to say, we, we, you know, Palestinians, because they did get pushed back. I mean, Egypt got pushed back, Barak got pushed back, um, uh, Haram, I, I suppose they call it. How much of the economic interest to see your neighbor grow after they just showed up and now you're still stuck in, you know, per capita in the thousands where they're in the doubles? Uh, did, did that come to the table for them to say, look, we're going to break from what might be considered the norm of Muslim and or Arab interest and say we want to get a, get a future for our youth? That was absolutely a part of it. I mean, look, the uh, the UAE ambassador to the U.S., uh, when he was justifying publicly the the accords, he, he kept quoting polling that says, look, the Palestinian issue for us rates low. So when we look at the polling, especially among the youth, mm -hmm. it's like number nine behind the economy, behind having a, a nice place to live, yeah. you know, quality of life. Yeah. And these are all things that by working with Israel w would be mutual benefit, have a mutual benefit. Okay. So this they understood that. Now, this, of course, puts the rest of the Arab world into a difficult situation or, or at least a decision point that I would argue should have come decades ago, which is Israel is here to stay. Now, it would be more beneficial for you to work with it than to continue to try to say that all of your internal problems are because of the Jewish state, right. which is really not even 
uh, a tenable argument at this it's point. Blame, it's not blame. all state-run yeah. media right now. Right. There is social media the state can't control communications. Right. So if the state is going to tell you it's the Jewish state's fault, yeah. there are people in the well, states talking to each yeah, other, you know, real people. Your own eyes. Right. Another thing. Exactly. And especially when you start to see the growth. I've always had hope because when you think, when you look at the youth in all of these countries, they're wearing American fashion, they're listening to American music, they really want to get beyond on some of the discussions from thousands of years ago. But you mentioned, especially I want to hear more about your book, because you mentioned that um, this was something you kind of knew going into it as you were advising with the Trump administration. How much of the, uh, how much influence was the fact that we started doing our own oil in this country, that those decisions that the Trump administration made that we were now producing for ourselves, that the Arab nations had to say, uh oh, we're in a different seat right now. Maybe we ought to open our, our eyes and maybe open our ears to, to play with Israel. That was certainly a really big factor. I mean, when we are energy independent, it allows us to say to our friends that, that we've been trying to say to them, you might want to diversify your economy or come more into this century's way of thinking, however you want to, want to characterize it. When you tell them, look, we don't really need the main thing you're selling <laughs> yeah. anymore. Yeah, right, so right. <laughs> you're going to need, and we're the major consumer of that. <laughs> so And Israel's moving on even without you. So Right. Yeah, well, I yeah. mean, Israel yeah. developed its yeah. brains because it didn't have hydrocarbons to begin with. Is one of the reasons that made it a success. It had no choice but to figure out how it could be a, a, a success Do economically. What we can. You know, I thank you, man. And, and, man, I'm going to have you when your book comes out because we've got to hear from that from you on this Thank because you. it's intriguing. And one of the reasons is just what you just said, not just on the blame game, but looking for resources to be successful in spite of everything else. And that's why this issue fascinates me, I think, because what we hear from the Palestinians is what we hear from BLM in, in the inner cities here in America. And we've just got to get beyond that messaging and say, hey, whatever gifts we have, we're going to use them too. So, you know, well, let's just do it. Whatever talents we have, we can make something beautiful out of them. So thank you for being with us. And I'll see you again very soon because this book is going to be out very soon. And uh, I'll be right back with my panel to continue in this discussion about the Israeli conflict that we're seeing today on the front pages. Yes, I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. Hello, I'm Franklin Graham. Uh, we've got a new year in front of us, 2021, and, and new opportunities. But for many, we've got the same old problem. There's that emptiness in your heart, and you've been trying to fill it with drugs and alcohol and sex and everything else, but it just doesn't work. Uh, you've been searching, but you don't even know what you're searching for. God is the only one who can fill that vacuum. If you've never trusted His Son, Jesus Christ, as your Savior, uh, do that today. You see, Jesus took our sins. He died on the cross. He was buried and God raised him to life. And he can come into your heart and change you and forgive you. Just pray this prayer with me right now. Just say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I believe Jesus is your son and I want to trust him today as my savior. I want to invite him to come into my life and take control. If you prayed that prayer, call that number that's on the screen. Do it right now. Call that number. Someone's willing to speak with you right now. Call that number. God bless. Well, a lot of us did see some movement toward peace during the Trump administration, but in the last six months with the Biden administration, immediately things started erupting again. And so I have some very special panelists uh, discuss this with us. And then I want to transition into some of the things we're hearing 
on the campuses that are happening in all, all across this country that are very, very disturbing. So of course, I have Jonathan Alexandre with us. Uh, you know him as a senior counsel for governmental affairs at Liberty Council Action. But he also, prior to going there, he was at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. So he's a specialist on this issue as well. So thank you. Thank I you wanted you to, me, I wanted to get your ideas on this one, to switch in hats a little bit yeah. because you've been on those religious liberty issues a whole lot. But this is very serious what we're starting to see, uh, and especially with the progressives in the Congress that are just forcing the hand of their colleagues uh, on these questions of Israel. So we want to talk to you about that. But I also want to talk to Jack um, Bywer. He is new to me and to you. Uh, he is a news writer at the Washington Free Beacon. It's an online news source that produces in-depth investigative reporting on a wide range of issues, uh, including public policy, government affairs, international security, the media. Thank you for coming. Because, uh, Jack, it's interesting that as I got into what you guys are doing at the Washington Free Beacon, it's like, whoa, these are my folks. So thank you for you start. Yeah. yeah, and it's an online news source. So we're going to look at that, you guys, so because um, they are speaking truth and that we need to know about. It's not, I haven't seen it in other newspapers, and, and, um, and it's important that we get ahead of things that we're hearing now, like the critical race theory and all this stuff that ends up in Washington. And we're like, when and where did this start? Well, it started a long time ago, and that's why I'm also very honored to have Benjamin uh, Weil with us. Thank you. He's the yeah. director of the project of the Project for Israeli National Security at the Endowment of for Middle East Truth. Okay, I'm going to have to say that again. You're the director of the Project for Israeli National Security at the Endowment for Middle East Truth. See, the reason I have to say it again is because I don't know the group like that. I know it as EMET, <laughs> and I've known <laughs> EMET forever. You guys, I'm on your list. You guys do incredible work. I've even been to some of the forums that you've done throughout the years to try to uh, let people know about what's happening in Israel, the relations that we have here in America, and uh, what EMET is is a public policy think tank here based in Washington, D.C. So I thank you, Benjamin, for coming in. Our paths may have crossed before. I'm very concerned about... Um, what we're seeing and hearing uh, that I don't think we've had too much of before to where we had a squad in the Congress who is really going to push the envelope. So tell us a little bit about what you guys have been looking at, what you've been doing, and, and, and what, what should we be thinking about? So uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me today, Star. Um, and uh, I, I will say that one of the trends that we've noticed actually in the Middle East is uh, a lot of our foes over there will look at what's going on in the United States and start using that as a tool against us here. Mm -hmm. So when they see the Black Lives uh, Matter movement or BDS or whatever it may be, they use that as a tool to attack the United States and uh, cut off any credibility that the United States has to preach to others about freedom, about democracy, about human rights, etc. So. Uh, having a, a, a radical squad in Congress and, and uh, expressing these very radical opinions, that's used as ammunition against us later by our adversaries in the region and even against our allies in the region, such as Israel and more. Wait, am I hearing you correctly? What you're saying is that part of the reason we're hearing all this hatred to America is to diminish our credibility around the world so that they can keep the tensions going in the Middle East? This is, that's precisely uh, right. This is used as fuel for our adversaries to then go and preach to us how we have no right to spread freedom if there are voices in our own Congress and uh, in some streets that are saying that United States is not a free country. And you know, it, it, it's interesting because, and Jonathan, I want you to get to this because I have felt that about why it is that they keep painting that black life doesn't work in America and, it, it, and what message it sends out to the rest of the world. But before I come to you on that, I really want you to weigh in on that one. Uh, but, but Jack, the, the Washington Free Beacon, you guys are pointing to a lot of what's happening with, uh, relating back to what Benjamin just said and mentioned the BDS movement, which I don't think anyone may know what it is. So I want you to weigh in on that because this is, this is almost frightening that there's just this consistency between the voices that we're hearing from squad and from the hard left and from the progressives and from what we're seeing on these campuses. And you alluded to, and we're going to get to all of this new energy against Jewish people in this country. But explain to 
us what is it about this BDS? What is it that you guys have been noticing and wanting to get out to the public? No, that's exactly right, Star. And in a lot of ways, it seems to me the BDS has been sort of a long time coming. We've been covering this in the, in the background. And, and so, it's the boycott. That's right. Okay, yeah. tell them what the it is. The boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. So essentially, it's this idea propagated by, by many activists that um, American businesses, American colleges, institutions in American life shouldn't be investing money um, in Israel. Um, we should be taking that money and putting it somewhere else. We should be sort of freezing our assets from Israel. Um, Cause they keep calling it apartheid state and they're right. colonialists yeah. and all and, of these and, other things. The yeah. language in the similar language that we keep hearing, you know, from the hard black left. Um, and so it's called BDS, boycott, divest, sanction. It's in the colleges. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's also in our Congress. Um, let, let me point out one story um, that would be, I think, <laughs> really useful for you here is the, the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Elliot Engel, the former chairman, New Yorker, a longtime pro-Israel Democrat, was primaried out of Congress uh, a couple years back yeah. by Jamal, uh, Jamal Bowman, yeah. um, who has flirted with BDS for several years. And I think yeah. as we, we see with some of the reporting we've done at the Beacon, um, you know, it, it's, it's all over the place. It's all over the place. And, and, and what's interesting, because they actually, once they won, because there were two of them running at that time that are joining the squad. And you guys are not following this maybe succinctly because you're raising your families and you're going to church on Sunday morning and all the rest of the things we're supposed to do in our lives, but we need to watch what's going on because now you're fighting the critical race theory and wonder how it started. And that's why I wanted to spend some time on this BDS movement because it's so similar. It stays under radar. It gets into colleges, then it gets into corporate, and then it comes to the rest of us in the nation. And so, uh, and, and, and Jonathan, this is alarming. And I know as a constitutional lawyer, uh, you're following many, many other issues over there at Liberty, but this one's into your heart as well because you're working on these uh, Jerusalem issues. So tell us a little bit about your thoughts and how these things are interrelated. And then on the other, the other side of break, we'll get to what do we do about it? Yeah, absolutely. And mentioning the squad is so critical where you have ancient anti-Semitic tropes now being re regurgitated by uh, the members of the squad and finding themselves in policy in the United States. And of course, you know, they, they use the idea of victim victimhood. They try to attach it to the BLM movement, saying that there is equal victimhood happening, happening for Palestinians in Israel. And any objective look by any metric as to what's actually occurring in Israel, uh, even by international law standard, even by laws of armed conflict standard, you're seeing an Israel that treats its citizens well, an yeah. open Israel that allows for Arab participation. You have an Arab on the Supreme Court. You have Arabs uh, that are able to work. They recognize that Israel uh, in its prosperity gives uh, even Palestinians the opportunity to travel into Jerusalem and, and work. Uh, so by any objective metric that you look at the situation, uh, you can you know refuse what the squad has done and certainly what uh, is infiltrating into U.S. policy in terms of uh, castigating Israel as being an oppressor or or, uh, developing a life in Israel that's untenable for Palestinians to live in. Well, we know that that's not true. And in fact, when I visited on one of my trips, I was, the first probably I was fascinated even in the diversity of Jewish people. I mean, there were some dark as me right. with machine guns on their back because they were 17 and had to go serve in the military. So Benjamin, I'm wondering what is going on deeper? Why is it now that we're seeing not just the venom that has continued from the in the Middle East, but now on our campuses to where now I don't I don't even know if a, if a Jewish person walking in New York City can feel safe anymore because of this tension uh, that is expressing itself through the campuses, through this squad. And those of you that don't know who these squads are, you need to stop voting for them. So you need to find out. But what in the world is it? I think that one of the most recent changes that here in the United States has definitely not helped the uh, anti-BDS movement is uh, an administration that's not willing to take a strong stand against it. Or when you see today a lot of uh, uh, politicians on Capitol Hill who are afraid to speak out in favor of Israel or against anti-Semitism because they fear what the extreme uh, 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 politicians on their side of the aisle will think or say about them or whether they'd be smeared on media. They will. I mean, you were just telling me a moment ago uh, during the break that there was a campus situation where they wanted to speak out on behalf of Israel and then them. They shut down your home now. And so tell us a little bit about uh, some of the stories that were that some might not be hearing but are happening. Yeah, so uh, that, that's exactly right. Uh, in the recent escalation between Israel and Hamas, there was an uptick around the world, but even over here in the United States in anti-Semitism. And um, the uh, campus on Rutgers, they issued uh, a statement that was against the rise of anti-Semitism and the uh, instances that uh, occurred. And they were forced to retract that oh. because of pressure 
of pro-Palestinian, pro-BDS movements and, and organizations. And I think it's really sad that we've come to a place where we can't even agree that anti-Semitism or, or, or which is a form, if you will, of, of uh, racism, is something that, uh, that, that we cannot tolerate. If we can't agree on that, then I don't know what we can agree on. You know, especially coming out of this new administration that just within the last couple of weeks, we see this whole thing on, we've got to stop the anti-Asian uh, uh, harassment. And now when we see what's happening to Jewish people in our country because of this uptick, it's, it's silence or it's backlash, because I've seen a couple of instances, I didn't know about the reference one, but I heard, I've seen a couple of instances. So, Jack, this what I'm seeing that you guys are reporting is that there is even a relationship between this BDS, the people involved in that movement, and the people involved in this critical race theory. Explain to me what it is they're after. I think that's exactly right. I mean, there's a certain worldview there. Um, there there's oppressed and there's oppressors. And so that, that's extended almost, I think, to um, the, the issues with Israel. And, and we see this not just um, in the United States. This is making Israelis less safe. Uh, many of the students that are coming through these schools are getting great jobs in Silicon Valley at these companies like Google, at Amazon. And, and these same, they, they for, don't forget their activism. And, and they write letters to the CEOs of these companies, many of whom have contracts with, with the IDF, telling them, we don't want our companies to have anything to do with the IDF. We want um, to, to be out of there in the same way that you know we're seeing this language with BDS um, on college campuses. So it doesn't just stay on campus, as we well know. It's, it's, right, it's everywhere. Right. So they're pressuring that now you can't even hire. You can't even. And that's where we know that they're going, because when you start hearing even congressional leaders say, oh, no, this is like apartheid, then it moves it into a whole new space to where, you know, it's basically um, segregation, it's cancellation, uh, Jonathan. Yeah, cancellation is a good word. The gross hypocrisy by much in the social media, allowing these anti-Semitic hashtags, uh, you know, uh, stab Israelis, stab Jews, they allowed these hashtags to go on in the past two weeks. Uh, they were late to the punch. TikTok was late to the punch. Facebook, uh, Twitter was all late to the punch in ultimately canceling uh, these hashtags. These are the hashtags that folks in, uh, in Israel, Palestinians in Israel, and even in the United States, when we saw an uptick in anti-Semitism, these are the hashtags that motivated them. There were stab Jewish challenges that would go around. I mean, and canceling. You know, if there's one thing that should be removed from from the internet, not being able to share, is these hashtags or these trending topics. Well, when they say that they they Jewish have people. these monitors that make sure that no hate is there. That sounds like hey, you had a comment. I think you were. Yes, I want to say something about the anti-Semitism, especially uh, about the apartheid. Sorry, especially today, okay. uh, because just yesterday there was a new government in Israel that is. Uh, uh, about to be formed, actually. And one of the main parties in this new government is an Arab party. So I don't know how uh, all these um, critics will say that Israel is an apartheid state when you have chief justices, you have generals in the military, you have a political party that's part of a future government okay. governing the state of Israel, ministers who are all Arab. And I, I don't accept that language. And I think that there's a huge difference between the apartheid that occurred in South Africa and where Israel is today. There's we, we know there is. It's just right. the languaging. It's like we're dealing with now. It's like if you mention Jim Crow long enough, people will get afraid enough and then they'll do what you want, which is purge your companies of any uh, dissent and all these other things. But you know what's interesting about uh, what you said, this, this coalition that has built within your own country, the diversity that's in your own country, so similar to our own. Are we going to hear from these other Arab states that that, that signed up to the uh, Abraham Accords? What what are your guys' thoughts on that? Because maybe to hear from some other Arabs to say, "Hey, wait a minute, guys, we're in the 21st century now." Yeah, I, th I think it's so critical to mention the Arab Accords. The, the, sorry, the Abraham, Abraham Accords with Arab states. The first in a generation, probably in a lifetime, that you have Arab states saying that we want to have normalized relationships with Israel. Of course, United Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco. Those are states that you'd recognize, but to have Sudan come in. Know, Sudan, awesome. Sudan was the location of the three no's in Khartoum back in 1967, where the majority of Arab states said they would never recognize Israel, they would never have peace with Israel, and they would never talk to Israel. They would not engage or recognize Israel. And they all agreed to this. So to have Sudan come around in full 180, change direction, and say we now want to normalize relationships okay. with Israel. That's all done under the Trump administration. Unfortunately, you have Biden administration come in and say, well, that 
had no sign of progress. There was nothing gained from the Abraham Accords. Uh, it's, it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got to wonder how, how we moved from there was nothing to gain from the Abraham Accords where we didn't see what we saw just over the last couple of weeks, exactly. missiles and all this other stuff. And then yet um, we're, we're now looking at under the Biden administration, the increase in all the tensions even here on our own campuses. We only have about 50 seconds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little break right now and then we're going to come back and continue this because I want to know and I want you guys to dig deeper for me. Who is this justice Democrats that are funding all of this stuff uh, in our country and see if we can kind of expose them so that they will stop or they'll know that they're being exposed so that we can get the people that are electing them that haven't thought through it real deeply. Who are these folks and why are they creating so much habit? Because what's really fascinating, guys, is the districts that these squads represent are in total chaos. It's not like the Palestinians can't fix what they own over there because they have all of Gaza. So we need to look at the similarities here and get behind who these mad people are that are now in our Congress that are continuing to divide so that they can con conquer for whatever agenda. Uh, we'll be right back after this message. It's time for a cure. Cure is a coalition of new voices with new ideas that will become new policies. We are the cure. The Center for Urban Renewal and Education, headquartered in Washington, D.C., CURE works with churches, political, and business leaders on behalf of urban communities. CURE's mission is to address issues of culture, race, and poverty from a Judeo-Christian perspective. CURE, join with us. There has never been a better time to help black communities. Hey, it's me, Star Parker, introducing you to something brand new called Power, Poverty, and Politics. And I'm going to usually have someone in the chair next to me. Uh, what we're going to do is start looking in depth on major, major challenges in our country, but mostly through authors, people that are writing tremendous works uh, so that we can engage, we can educate ourselves, we can equip ourselves to do amazing things for our country, for our culture, and ultimately for the communities that are so in disarray that they just get so limited information because they've been so controlled by the hardcore left that they don't know what to do. So I'm excited about it, and we're gonna start it within the next couple of weeks, and I just wanted to give you the heads up so that you can start telling your friends, so that you can begin to face it out, and to uh, Twitter it out, and to do all those other social media out that we're going to start looking at power, poverty, politics from a brand new perspective with me, Star Parker. that we were talking about during the break that I'm like, oh, I forgot to let them know about that. Uh-oh, because you might not even know what we're talking about with the missiles going back and forth, what the IDF stands for. So we're going to get more into it with our panel because you got to understand this. You know, especially as Bible believers, there's a part of the Bible that says, there's not peace there, there's not peace here. So I have Jonathan with us. Jonathan Alexandria, you know, as Senior Government Affairs at um, Liberty Council, but he's also Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. That's where he was before he went over to Liberty. Liberty. So he's been studying these issues. He's been impassioned by these issues. So thank you thank and for you bringing me. your insight on that. Uh, Jack Byer, news writer at the Washington Free Beacon. It's an online news source that I now am exposed to and I'm excited about. And we're going to be watching their news because they're giving us insight into places we haven't been. And so thank you for coming and being with us. And then Benjamin Weil, <laughs> director of, of a project at EMET. Okay, E-M-E-T. What is your website, actually? It's EMET online.org. Emmetonline.org. We have a lot of fact sheets on all of these subjects that we're discussing now okay. uh, for for your audience if they'd like more information okay. and, and gain more insight and weekly webinars on all these hot topics. Oh, awesome, because the, this is an audience that's very concerned about Israel. And then they saw, you know, Jonathan, as you mentioned a break, did they even know that what happened, that tit for tat, right. we might have just heard that, okay, it stopped at a certain point. So Emmet, you call it? Emmet. I call it Emmet. Emmet. Um, and that's the endowment for Middle East truth. Okay. And, and so you want to end it? Emmet is the Hebrew word for truth as well. Oh, so it's a play on words over there. Really? 
really? You speak so the truth. Okay. Facts only. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. So that's a think tank you want to get on their website, especially if you're passionate by this and pastors, especially you, because you're not getting half the news. <laughs> we're not getting the news. And it's getting bigger and bolder. And now we're even getting headlines that there's a rift in the Democrat Party, because as you heard coming into this segment, that there's a push, pushing them out. They're um, actually, oh, in fact, I think that you mentioned that, Jack. So tell us what happened. They, this justice Democrat, they are, they are a pack. They're backing these left-wing Democrat candidates. Uh, they endorsed two that just got in. This one from New York. This one from I think um, Miss Missouri. Uh, actually, replacing black caucus members with radical extremists. And and they are behind the squad. Those of you that don't know it, that's that uh, Ocasio Cortez. That's Presley out of Massachusetts. That's Omar out of Minnesota. That's Tahlib out of out of Michigan. We're in trouble. No, absolutely right. And, and in a lot of ways, I mean, these are folks who aren't extremists in the Democratic Party. They have their hands in the levers of power. Uh, Ilhan Omar has a seat on the Foreign Affairs Committee. So she's in a position where she can dictate to a degree or, or have some control over the policy line that the Democratic Party is bringing out on these subjects. And this subject is 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 real. And in fact, I think that we move so quickly as a nation from the extreme of the BLM to where they put everybody on notice that you speak out against us, you're, you, you're, your kids are at risk. And then we move straight into this where I don't know if it was anticipated that. Um, uh, Jonathan, I think you've been following the actual details of what happened. What happened that we saw that right. Gaza just thought that they should start a war with Israel? Yeah. Why we see this in the headlines is because, you know, there was a war. There was an 11-day war, you know, initiated by Hamas terrorists, launching missiles into Israel, attacking Israeli population centers, intentionally attacking areas where you have Israeli c civilians that have just seconds between hearing a siren and being able to run into your bunker because you're literally being showered with missiles. If it wasn't for the Iron Dome, this system that repels in midair, literally sending out a bullet to hit another bullet. If it wasn't for this Iron Dome system, you'd have massive casualties of Israelis as Hamas, a terrorist organization, sending 4,300 rockets intentionally targeting uh, Israeli civilians. And when Israel retaliates, as any sovereign nation should, having the right to defend themselves, then you hear this false equivocation, um, you know, this this moral this saying Israel is not morally justified in defending himself. And ultimately, you find the headlines that we're reading and finding its way into Congress and policy, uh, castigating Israel and saying that they're the bad actors in all this. But why now? Go ahead. Be a yeah, I, I, I would just like to add that uh, it, it's Hamas, it's the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Those are the two main parties mm -hmm. in, in Gaza Strip. And what a lot of the pro-Palestinian advocates or even uh, legislators in Capitol Hill forget is that the two main things that Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad are doing is number one, shooting from a civilian population yeah. in Gaza Strip, which oh, is wow. a violation of international law. And then the other thing they're doing is they're shooting indiscriminately into a, uh, a, a civilian population in Israel, which is also a violation of international law. And somehow, the Palestinians or Hamas in Gaza is the victim, even right. though they're committing two grave international, they're uh, breaching two uh, international laws over there, while Israel, all they're doing is shooting missiles to defend themselves and destroying infrastructure that belongs to terrorists yeah. and that helps these terrorist organizations. Let me ask you this then, because where this happened, why now? Four years we've had what we might call a little bit of peace, and where is the international community? If this, if this is... Why isn't Europe speaking up? And then I'm wondering, I asked you earlier about the Arab nations that maybe they're like, yikes, what do we do here? But where is Europe on this if they're violating these types of, uh, of treaties and, and, and conditions of war? Well, Europe for the past uh, decade or so, or since this whole, uh, what's called in Arabic an intifada, since this whole wave of violence has uh, started in the early 2000s, they have pretty much uh, backed this the, the Palestinians with this notion that Israel is an occupier, Israel is an aggressor. So uh, I'm, I'm not that surprised to see that uh, the Europeans, it, whether through uh, finances or political actions, are backing the Palestinians. I will note that there are some countries like Hungary, for instance, that have become very close to Israel mm -hmm. and have been helping Israel in the UN, in the EU, and trying to work together, at least until the, uh, until the end of the uh, Trump administration, to work together 
in trying to facilitate a stronger foreign policy towards Israel to, to bring more peace and stability, mm -hmm. because as long as this conflict continues, there won't be rest in that land. And the only way that can happen is if we uh, exterminate all of the terrorist uh, activities, all the organizations over there, and rebuild so that all the money that does pour into the Palestinians doesn't go to build tunnels and fund rockets, right. but goes towards education, welfare, a medical health and uh, systems and, and the health system in, in general, I think that that's what will bring the peace is once they put down their weapons and use that money to rebuild themselves. Well, and they need to recognize that that's their responsibility now. Israel did give up a lot to let them go build, you know, and you have the ability to do that. And I'm glad to hear that about Hungary because we're hearing some good signs about what's happening under their new leadership. But I'm wondering as well that the that the that the it, that the international community taking the position that you're taking has to be little caught off guard that the minute the Trump administration leaves that yep. now we're seeing this again, how then is our administration saying, well, maybe the answer is to get back in and deal with Iran. Yeah. And that's real, real time and place. Iran has its hand on the lever. They have their the strings on the puppet. They're carefully watched, if not funded, but carefully watch what's going on in Hamas. Certainly they have full stake on the northern border of Israel now, on the other side, uh, Iran, Okay. F mm -hmm. full yeah. stake mm -hmm. on the northern border of Israel where they're funding Hezbollah. Uh, watching how Israel responded to Hamas, saying, well, you know, this is the amount of rockets that Israel will send out. This is uh, Israel self-restraining itself. They're, they're all, they're planning and masterminding what they've always said they wanted to do, Iran, which is attack and ultimately eliminate Israel. What, what the Biden administration has been soft in doing, but what it should do in about face and do is remain away from the Iran deal. This is something uh, that Trump pulled us out of. It was good to be pulled out of. Iran has never changed its perspective on trying to amass weapons. It has never stopped its funding of terrorism across the world. It's never going to be an ally for peace in the area. It's going to always going to be the instigator, uh, and then that's that's one place to start. Well, I think I guess so. I want to hear your thought, and then I'm going to go to Jack on on because he mentioned worldview. So I'm going to ask him about that. But what get yeah, and speaking of the uh, international community, just last Thursday, the Human Rights Council yeah. of the UN mm -hmm. uh, decided to uh, to uh, investigate Israel for war crimes as a result of the uh, current, the most no. recent escalation. Yeah. No. And the most interest, the two most interest, interesting things about that are number one is that there were sixty some countries that called for this probe. And all but one are ranked below Israel on their human freedom wow. uh, index. How are they even taken seriously? Right. This is crazy mad. Exactly. And the and the second interesting uh, uh, part of this is that they're only they only call to investigate Israel, but not Hamas. So they're only investigating one side of this conflict. And from specific date, from the date where Israel started retaliating and, and responding. And there were and it was a response. Hamas started this conflict. That's like you guys are getting in a fight and then you find the one that started the fight, but you go after the other one. I think it comes down to what you said, Jack, worldview. Talk into that because there's something deeper. Uh, behind this, that it's not just a well. This has been two thousand years ago, six thousand years of them always fight. No, this is deeper than that. This is a worldview, and it's here in this country. It's connected to Israel. It just seems like that whole Judeo-Christian ethic is under attack. I think that's exactly right. I mean, when you look at the way the education system functions in this country, or, or is supposed to function, it's about teaching civics, about teaching history, about forming good citizens. Um, in recent years, I mean, to see these things with the sixteen nineteen project included in many schools, um, we're rethinking what history means to our students, and, and so. So if we're equipping students with um, an inability to, to process history the way, right way, to, to see things um, in, in the way that it, it, they should be seen, um, you know, we're going to be having to make poor decisions about well, let me, let me Because some might not have been following this news on the 1619, because this is part of the theory that's been driving some of this critical race theory that we also see in this B, uh, DS theory, uh, but it is rooted in a, in a world view. But explain a little bit about, because in my opinion, uh, why we're having this discussion in our history books is because, or, or what history should look like. As America, we were founded on that Judeo-Christian principle. We have a system of capitalism that accompanies it, means free markets, and then you put a, a rule of law in place, and it works in countries uh, where you do that, regardless of how diverse they are. I mean, it works in Israel, it works here, it works in what we call democracies. But so get a little bit more deeper into what you were telling us right now because you see the insight but if you're talking to someone who's like 
I don't understand that. What happened? What I, I just get up and go to church on Sunday morning and believe it. And now they're seeing their whole worldview personally attacked. But it is rooted in this 1619. We have people that are just simply evil and trying to rewrite everything. No, I think that's right. And part of it as well is you have a lot of these sort of well-meaning college administrators who might believe a lot of the same things that, that we're talking about um, in, a, in a positive light here, but, but are frankly afraid a lot of times to, to, to voice So they're well-meaning, but they're afraid. Right, because you have the, these student activists <laughs> who, who, are, who are drafting these letters. <laughs> and I, and I, Wait a minute. I don't well, know if I can I, call them well-meaning. Well, they can't be well-meaning if they're afraid. I mean, just like if you, if you know truth, yeah. Which we just heard that amen is truth, but you're afraid to say it, then I don't know which is worse, the person right. that's saying it, that I know you're my enemy, or the person that's like, I know the truth, but I'm not going to tell you. Yeah, and it's from top down. Yes, it's student activism, but the administration and the professors that start with Holocaust denial in your first year of, of, of many institutions, that's I mean, they're, they're, right. they're insidious. They, 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 they do not right. have the best intention of telling the right story of history yeah. uh, when it comes to these college campuses. Okay, we only have a couple of minutes. This segment went so fast. I, how, how do we turn around? What do we do? I think that education is the first place to go. Uh, the education system, you have textbooks, and this is in the Palestinian Authority, but even here in the United States as well, textbooks and professors who uh, express only one uh, political view about, uh, about some of these matters. And I think that we have to call for either abolishing that or some sort of diversification gotcha. so that we can expose students and these uh, young students who then, as you mentioned, later become uh, policy makers and decision makers and uh, executives of big uh, uh, companies to then be more educated and see that their point of view is not the only point of view and that it's most likely that it's at the other point of view it, that that's correct and right, they, right. they ought to know that this is not the world view on anti-semitism or on Israel or whatever uh, topic it is. You know I agree that that when, once truth is once the light comes in people then make better decisions and that's probably why they fight so hard to keep us out of not just on the campuses and the truth on these campuses. Uh, the Trump administration tried to build an alternative to that 1619 by doing the 1776 that Biden got rid of immediately. So speaking to the media plays a role in this too. We're not seeing truth there as well. What can we do? No that's absolutely right. I mean, in the coverage of, of, of this conflict we've seen so so much coverage of, of of casualties going on in, in the Gaza Strip, and, and very little about civilians who've been who've been killed by uh, Hamas rockets in, in Israel. And so, you know, if the American people fundamentally don't know what's going on, how are they going to make good decisions about uh, electing Congress people or, or calling their Congress people about, about what's going on? So I guess we have to go to the Washington Free Beacon. They can go there. What's that website? That's right, uh, freebeacon.com. Freebeacon.com, because that's where we're going to find out a little bit more. And then what else do we do? I, I, think, I think well, two things. Weigh everything you see and read about Israel by objective standards. International law, Israel always passes the test. Uh, by financial standard, Israel's going to pass the test. Look at the amount of uh, companies they have on our own stock market. Uh, but culturally, I think there's, there's one thing that practically that we can do if able is to travel to Israel yourself. I know that some of that each, every one of us has done at this, on this panel. We've been to Israel. We've seen the sites uh, from a Christian biblical perspective, walk where Jesus walked, and then get a political understanding about the terrain and why it should be under Jewish control. Be able to interact with with the huge diverse population, the Ethiopians, the Arabs, uh, the Jews that all make part of, of, of the Jewish state, uh, be able to interact with them and see what is actually going on on the ground. And then, and then, and then Gaza, because when one of the trips that I made there, they had given up more land, Israel, because they keep being talked into doing this, and then it was under this control. You couldn't get in there, and then they, and they, it was trashed by then. It was like almost everything that was beautiful. They're going the opposite direction. So, what can you say? We only have like forty seconds um, about Gaza. Can they build? Can what? Oh, we hear the same thing about those Palestinians that we hear about black people. That you're just a bunch of victims. You can't do this. Unfortunately, can it's a political calculation. If Hamas is going to be in power, they want a chokehold on the mm -hmm. Gazan people. Uh, they use it to their benefit, to their so the property. People have benefit. the ability to build. They, let's let's put, they, take Hamas out. Let's take the Black Caucus out. Let's take all these so-called leaders out of this and say, yeah. because I think a lot of it's rooted in, but they don't have the capacity. At any any time we have yeah, capacity? anytime they do. Anytime we've the U.S. has sent money there, that money has been taken by Hamas and used to build tunnels to funnel rockets and That's stuff right. into Israel. But the people so, themselves, the Palestinians, and the, and God has distributed to them gifts and talents too, right? Absolutely. So if they wanted to get good leadership, they could do exactly what their neighbor Israel did. Can't they? They can, and they, they can. And, and they want to, I believe. And they want to. Then that gives us hope because if they really 
really want to, then we're going to let them. We're going to support them. So thank you. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Thank you, thank you Jack. Thank you, Jonathan, for being here. And I'll be right back with some final thoughts. Let's take a quick history lesson. Just two centuries ago, 94% of the people in the world lived in extreme poverty. Today, it's eight and a half percent. In a century, our life expectancies more than doubled. How did we come so far so fast? The freedom to create, to start a business, to keep what you earn. Don't let the socialists and radical left cost us our progress, our freedom, and our well being. It's time we fight for America and vote for America. Yes, I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. For Cure. Cure is a coalition of new voices with new ideas that will become new policies. We are the Cure. The Center for Urban Renewal and Education, headquartered in Washington, D.C., Cure works with churches, political, and business leaders on behalf of urban communities. Cure's mission is to address issues of culture, race, and poverty from a Judeo Christian perspective. Cure, join with us. There has never been a better time to help black communities. perfect world, it's so much easier to hate and blame than to take personal responsibility to create and build. We're seeing what's happening in Israel here in our own country. We're Black Lives Matters movement and the political left embracing critical race theory, which peddles the distortion and lies that American history is about a dominant, oppressive white class rather than an ongoing struggle for all to take personal responsibility to prevail under freedom. Worse, those who choose to buy into the great lie that their lives are about what others do rather than what they choose, get paid off politically and in lawsuits resulting from inevitable tragedies that emerge from this culture of irresponsibility. Similarly, Palestinian terrorists get paid off by sponsored terrorist nations such as Iran, and through massive foreign aid from confused, left-wing dominated Western countries. Subsidizing blame and irresponsibility produces squalor, a culture of hard work and personal responsibility, despite a world that is often unclear and often seems unfair and unjust. This produces miracles like the modern state of Israel. We're standing with Israel here at Cure America, and I hope you will too. And I hope you'll join us again next week when we take on another important topic so that we can cure America.